So, um, so originally I had a very ambitious idea for this talk. Uh, I thought that it would be really interesting to look at the references that Bill uses in study number three, um, which uses material almost entirely based on, uh, I was about to say two decades, it's more than that it's actually. 30 years. 30 years um, of work. So it's all quotes, there's no original material, material in the piece the whatsoever, piece. nothing. Um, it's only pieces that have existed. Yeah. And I had this idea that we look at the, the sort of original sources of the material in those older ballets, then we look at study number three and we talk about um, how those things evolved. And then I realized that was a you know, three hour talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're gonna do something simpler uh, and talk about, um, well, we'll see where it goes. But um, I was particularly interested in talking about uh, the relationship of Bill's work to ballet. I don't know if that's exactly the right way of putting it, but ballet as it embedded in Bill's work because um, I've always felt it's sort of, uh, the people, especially now, because many people have come to Bill's work within the last 10 years or so, when the, um, the work he's made has not been um, articulated or manifested in a particularly recognizably balletic way, but I think it's a mistake to see the work as, you know, having been a kind of, um, he was making ballets and now he's doing something else. Because to me, you know, even, even in those years where many of the works were what, what Bill calls ballet ballets, um, I think there was really a continuum uh, manifest of interest that was manifested that you see very, very early on. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that that was my original, um, the, the, what Bill was doing with ballet in the work was my original um, entrance point to it. I first saw it in, I first saw a piece called New Sleep in 1988, um, which really, um, you know, it's not an exaggeration to actually say it changed my life. <laughs> it really isn't because um, it showed me ballet as a contemporary art form, uh, not something between quotation marks, not a museum piece, something that could exist legitimately in the modern world as contemporary art. Um, and yet it was, you know, it had recognizable ba ballet elements, in it, but it was recontextualized. And I think, you know, that's in a way what we're talking about in, in study, study number three, is that there's a, a, a recontextualizing. of everything, yeah. Um, and that work is all, it's all still in there. Yeah. Um, so let's, well, let's talk about, let's talk about Ballet first, and um, and the the development of some of the movement ideas. I mean, Dana touched on on it a little bit in her talk when she was talking about the idea of disfocus. I think we can also bring it back to this music question: is like mm -hmm. uh, uh, a diminished seventh is not restricted to one particular composition. It could appear in in mm -hmm. a, a number of compositions if the context is right. If it makes sense in the composition up to a certain point to have that um, event, then you can put it there, it doesn't mean uh, just because it was happened to appear in another composition that is exclusively the, uh, the, property. the property of that, yeah. That it can only be in that particular relationship. And that's what's actually nice is that things, it's nice to see when things don't require their original context. You realize that things are actually quite liberated uh, on their own. And we just have a habit of saying, oh, this belongs there. And that's what Dana was talking about. Oh, could you see the, you know, a way of working? So people say, oh, I have my piece and it's finished. And I was like, wow, how did you do that? <laughs> you know, uh, because um, uh, apropos artifact, for example, which I've changed for, what, 25, 30 years. Um, well, of course you change it because 25, 30 years ago, I couldn't choreograph as well as I could now. Why wouldn't I change it? You know what I mean? If I could make a piece better, wouldn't that be better for the people watching it? I assume, you know. So, so this, then you're dealing with uh, um, the kind of fixation on originality and authenticity. So does that, it, where's that rule written down? Uh, I, got, I Googled, Amazon doesn't have the book, <laughs> apparently. And uh, so I think there's a number of things that are received. You receive this idea about things being fixed to terms that are hanging in the cloud above culture and saying origin, the original, et cetera, et cetera. I understand there is historical interest in these things, 
But on the other hand, a work is a living thing. So long as the choreographer is alive, the work is alive too, or potentially alive. And so I will change either over decades or I will change from minute to minute, you know, depending on the situation. So um, what the phrase I use, what Dana was using before is, what are the properties of the present? And I don't mean just this immediate present, but the epoch we're in or the week we're in or the day we're in. So the situation, again, is someone sick, is someone off, are they injured, is it a new cast? Um, uh, for example, someone was off last week and I re-choreographed the piece. Unfortunately, then she wasn't in the piece anymore because another scene had taken place out of necessity, but that scene was better than the scene of the person who was absent. So that was a kind of unfortunate moment there. Uh, it was a little uncomfortable. But um, uh, you just have to look at what's necessary. And so I, I did the best I could under the conditions and it turns out it was better than the conditions before. So what are you gonna do? You know, um, but I, I think this obsession with preservation is a little bit tricky. You know, you're trying to, for example, being in ballet companies for years myself, this idea of like, okay, and you go like this, or the famous one with the ballerina. When I was doing the part, I did it, you know, I did this or that, and um, which is useful information, but it's not law. It's not law. It isn't, yeah. And, and that's what you did early on, didn't you, was to, to take, um, take some the precepts and principles of ballet and say, how can these be used? They don't have to be used in the same way as they have always been used. Or must they be used, or must Razi? They be yeah, used. yeah, must they be used? Yes. Because we, 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 like I said, this rec these received notions of how to practice, like how do you run your, your practice, your work, your rehearsals, uh, and your, your compositional practices, and there's a lot of received notions. You know? Yes, I mean, yeah. even something as simple as the way dancers walk on stage. I mean, it's still quite interesting when you see, you know, I'm thinking of in the middle, there's a section where the dancers simply turn around and they all march off in a line. Yeah. And it's still quite interesting to see when you see ballet companies do that, even today, they often don't do it well because they don't, they can't, you know, there's a way of walking on a for a ballet dancer on a ballet stage that they have learned since they were this high. And it's very difficult to um, to unlearn those habits and those conventions that are yeah, ingrained well, in your yeah. body. Well, the thing is, you're talking to someone in rehearsal, and they're like, "Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like that, like that," and they're perfectly normal people. And then <laughs> they they get on stage, and all of a sudden, they have to um, they feel it's obligatory to sustain their balletic persona. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, "Oh, well, you don't have to do that. Why don't you just just stand, you know, be yourself." because you're very nice, you know, and you're an interesting person, and you're a great dancer. Um, and then when you're dancing, really dance the best you can, you know, but you don't have to sustain this artificial better self, so to speak, which is, in the case of a ballet dancer, a more balletic presence, you know what I mean? In, in, like when you see ballet dancers who walk down the street and they're, they're, they're walking like this, you know? Um, you can, it can be feel comfortable if you're a ballet dancer, but, um, um, but it doesn't have to be like that. And that was one of our mottos is uh, literally, yeah, is it doesn't have to be like this. So we all assume things. And this, uh, these assumptions we make about things are yeah, so dramatic. You know, yeah. I, think, I think one of the things that you really, um, you really looked at very closely as well was notions of partnering in ballet early on right. and completely changed that because I mean the, the sort of conventional notion is that the man is, um, sorry, <laughs> the man is, is that better? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, a, a supportive passive presence uh, who, who right. allows the ballerina to, to make shapes. Well, guess what? Uh, there's a class that sometimes used to be taught in ballet schools, it's called partnering class, mm. right? <laughs> That's what I thought it was. Partnering, you're being partners, you know, partners, which I believe the word parity has something to do with that. Little did you know. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, paré in French, I guess, yeah. So, partnering is meaning sharing work, yeah, for me. So, uh, a duet is shared work, yeah. Um, in the current repertoire, we have, we have a lot of dual material. People will manipulate material around each other without 
actually coming into contact, mm-hmm. very little contact, um, which is both people sharing work around a subject. Yeah, a majority of the duet kind of things that happened or uh, uh, last night were the um, I call it the extraction method, what Dana was talking about uh, from uh, Wolf Phrase, which is you have this phrase and people make avoidance phrases around it and then you pull it out and um, a lot of those duets are all about this um, eidetic version of something else that they're sharing. They know there's something in between. For example, the um, Japanese man and the blonde woman, Katty, um, they're sharing material around the original phrase from Robert Scott. Mm-hmm. It's called tuna. And uh, that is um, something that is, the first dance that happens in the second part is also that exact same phrase, but differently organized. And then later on, when the guys go kapunk and they all walk in, that's also the same material but differently organized. So there's different ways to, um, how would you say, a subject is, doesn't always have to be visible, but it can be present for the dancers. Yeah. Approached. Yeah, they all are remembering, for example, I could have been, the original one could have been, you know, something like this, but um, boom, boom, boom. They all now know where they are in relationship. So you've gone in relationship to that. You tried to avoid my hand, pull your hand out of the way. Right, okay. I now know that the original this is that for you. Mm. So we end up learning what your relationship to it was. So everyone in the cast knows exactly what the other person's relationship is to the invisible thing. And that's the tricky part. That's what takes time. So you actually know where everyone else is in relation to something invisible. And that's rigor. That's 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 really hard. And that's just. I mean, that's it's that's one very, method. <laughs> yeah, that's just one idea uh, involved in generating movement. And I thought actually it would be interesting to talk about for you, Bill, to talk about some of the other um, some of the other. Th- I mean, of yeah. course, it can't yeah. be exhaustive at all. But there there have been several important points. Um, I think for you uh, in in terms of generating movement, uh, there was you know points. Uh, like reading externally or disfocus, where um, ideas and whole works have come out of those um, those rehearsal processes. Well, I, I think it fi- it finally boils down to the the nature of attention. It doesn't matter what the method is; yeah. it's your relationship to the method, um, and it's the quality of attention that you pay. Finally, if you if you go to hear. Um, Sirkin play or uh, Rubinstein or whoever, they're dead, but they won't play much anymore. But um, um, what you're going to hear is the quality of attention to an idea. So the composition is an idea, it's a proposition, it's a hypothesis, and so on. Liszt says, okay, this is my hypothesis about music. <laughs> this is, it, music can appear in this form. Yeah. And then the artist, in that case, those excellent people, or let's say um, uh, Sirkin playing the Hamrak Klavier, the famous recording, uh, where it's kind of off the charts. Um, it has to do with, I'd say, um, it's, it's ontological. It's a state of being. It's a way of being in relationships. So he's obviously in the position of a translator. We can't, we, can, we look at the, at the page and we go, black marks on a white page. And, and Sirkin says, oh, that is actually something that sounds like this. So you're going from one medium, yeah, or one domain, to the other. So from the visual, actually. He's going from the visual domain through his body to the domain of tactility, yeah, and then motor, and he's m- moving th- through this machine, <laughs> this, this inert object, mm. and creating things that go back into your auditory senses. Yeah. And so it's a kind of really interesting cycle at that. So we need Rudolf Serkin to pay attention yeah, to this. And it's the quality of attention. You don't want to hear him be, okay. Mm. You don't want to hear him be like, yeah, no, it's okay. Like that. We, uh, you never go to the theater hoping it'll be okay. You, know. you want people to basically obliterate themselves with their attention, even if they're paying attention to not paying attention. Do you know what I mean? It, it, there's, yeah. there's no way you can escape this moment of, of how can I say it, of presence. 
Even if you say, I refuse to be attentive and aware, great, keep aware of that. <laughs> you know, like how it's, so it's sustaining um, a way of being. And as Dana talked before, I said, these are, are behaviors. Yeah, yeah I mean, Peter asked Dana if it was frightening to be in, have 130 potential dance combinations and four instructions and, you know, changes of direction and perhaps you in her earphone saying, no, go upstage or yeah. um, do it backwards. Ah, but then finally, it's not the point of keeping track of 130 no. combinations. The point is the state you're in. Yeah. So that is as then the audience sees the performer in a particular state, and that's what I'm going for, not their mastery of 130 combinations. Yeah, it's the heightened, and 12 directions. The heightened yeah. awareness and presence. It's them going uh, uh like that, and then you notice them that way, rather than do a dramaturgical thing saying, okay, you're kind of nervous, you're worried about things being confusing, you could go the psychological route, which is standard theater, right? But instead, you get the performer in a, a kind of less... Uh, determinate state, and yet very clearly they're in a state, yeah. And you can't say exactly what that state is, and that's nice. You know, they're sad. Oh, they're confused. Oh, they're nervous. You know, like oh, that would be so uninteresting to watch because you realize that it was synthetic, yeah. yeah. And this way, they're not being synthetic. They are actually confused and worried that they're not going to make it, and that's what you're trying to present. Yes, and, and I think that's what you've always wanted right from the beginning of your work, whether it's been working with formal ballet technique and yeah, yeah, it's a accepted different codes. A different approach it's to regie, different. to dramaturgy, yeah. yeah, in that sense. Um, yeah. And that's also why I think it's not so important. I mean, people often say about Bill's work that, or they ask me, what does it mean? Or, you know, what is it? <laughs> I wish that. I, I, I had no I, idea. I didn't know you knew. <laughs> no, <laughs> Great, no, what does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> Crap, I should have asked you. <laughs> um, no, people do ask this, and, you know, I, that's not a question that's ever worried me about Bill's <laughs> work. Um, I don't know, you know, I always say, I don't think, you know, it's not important to know that there are 130. It's interesting, but it's not important. Okay, here, I have a great story. I have, I'm full of anecdotes. Um, you know, the guy goes, ah, ah, yeah. ah. It was originally a woman, and so she, her, her voice was quite high-pitched, and it's usually 100, and... And the intermission, uh, an elderly gentleman came to me and he said, seagulls. <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> right? He's right. Yes. Yeah. What does it mean? It means, I mean, I'm supposed to assume there is some ideal spectator who all, and that you are all somehow possess identical properties, like, it's so, it's so rude, actually. Going like, oh, right, so you, you're assuming people are just uniform. That means meaning is somehow evenly spread and there are no differences in society, background. And I mean, you know, the whole nine yards. Like, oh, really? People. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what does it mean to people? Anything. They say, uh, Robert, Robert Scott. Robert Scott. That's actually a, it's a good... Um, Segway. I'm glad, yes, I'm glad <laughs> it made me think of something because... Um, uh, it's a good entry point to talking about um, study and the way that this material was used or how you perhaps started to work with it, the different material. Uh, because, Rob, that, you know, I first saw that um, close to when it was made, I think, in 88 or 89. And to me... Robert Scott. Robert Scott. Yeah. And to me, that section where the woman, she's not sitting in, in Robert Scott, she st comes to the cl very close to the front of the stage and she does, this, she does the, um, the shriek and the arms a hundred times. And... Um, to me, I've got no idea whether this is, you know, right or <laughs> not. The audience is always right. Yeah, the audience <laughs> is always, always right. Always. It was like, you know, the 36 foites in Swan Lake. It was like it was a virtuosic feat of reproducing something physically, identically, over and over and over again at the same time. So to me, that can, you know, and again, that connects to, to ballet and um, to, to my particular connection to Bill's work. Um, and I was fascinated last night because... For, for quite a lot of, you know, the study is a fantastic piece to watch if you've been watching Bill's work for a long time because you're like, a, you can watch it like a detective going, oh, that's, you know, that's this bit, and I went, is that that bit? Oh, but the music's different, you know, it's really um, fun. <laughs> <laughs> but, for, but of course, most people in the audience are not watching the, the piece like that. Right. They yeah, are, you have to really think about yeah, that. Yeah, they're really just experiencing it as its own thing. 
Um, but I was fascinated last night uh, that when Fabrice did the, um, uh, shrieks. the shrieks, um, the audience started to clap. So, which I that's like the old. That's how it used to be yes. too. And I thought, well, they they recognise this as a virtuosic act. Um, in fact, even though they have no idea, you know, of the context, the original context, which actually was very related to the idea of ballet as an impossible um, quest. Um, but they, they understood that even completely. I like the fact that they actually make noise. I like that they make noise in relationship to him. It's like, blah, 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 blah. and then they, oh, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's so cool. You know, I love that when people get all excited and well, like, can't contain themselves. You it know, was like, like the moment on stage, which I laughed yeah. at when I think it was Josh after they do the oh, NNN and Riley. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's how you feel, especially having just watched NNN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're sort of waiting for the surge yeah. of emotion. Oh, for example, NNN's not on tonight. Oh. <laughs> it's not on tonight. Oh. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> you know. it's no, no, it's not on tonight. Nah, no, nah, I'm gonna try it without. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 try it. It's, 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 I think it's, um, uh, no, it's enough. It's enough. Yeah, it's enough. It'll be fine. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and I tell you why, uh, actually. Uh, we had a problem because uh, one of the guys wasn't available for rehearsal. And I found the performance, um, um, I'm gonna say, the um, Schwung. The, uh, the, um, uh, yeah, no, the, the, the musical elasticity was all gone in the phrasing. And uh, it has to, it, it, it's a really complicated piece. They're basically like a string quartet, and they have to self govern. But um, if you can't, don't have the time to do that with your, each other, then it's basically, you know, playing bum, bum, bum. So I felt that the uh, phrase, Phrasing timings were extremely regular, very predictable. Um, um, that the emphasis was um, it should be ba like that, ba like that, and it was boom, They were moving in a kind of slow waltz instead of a scherzo. You know what I mean? It was like it was just two kinds of three, and it was the wrong kind. Yeah, and um, they should go. Uh, they should go. Ba ba da ka da ka. And it was like, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. so it was, again, marching as opposed to like a lighting or like if you throw a stone, it goes on the water, you know, and there was none of that. And it takes time. You can't just say, do it. And you know, I tried some, some Reggie things and they tried their best, um, but it's, it's, I'd rather not show it if it's not going to be really excellent you know it's okay it was fine you know and that's anathema actually you say ana anathema anatema mm -hmm. yeah, anathema for me so I'd rather I think you're better off not seeing something okay <laughs> you the viewers yeah yeah you are but N N N N is actually in the piece as well. They are part yeah. of it. In it's fact, in those the, very four men. Yeah, the four men that do the breathing thing. That's that's the opening sequence of four N. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So, won't you tell us a bit about how how the idea of using this material, this huge body of work built up over thirty years, mm. um, came into being? It actually had to do with the. Um, with the fact that I realized I had this contract in which I had to make three full evenings a year. Do you know what that means, making three full evenings a year? Not only am I author, I'm choreographer, I was doing everything, you know, lighting set, blah, blah, blah. I was like, wow. <laughs> I think this contract is forcing me to overproduce because you couldn't perform that work because you couldn't get enough engagements to actually keep performing the work you're making. You know, there's just, there isn't enough time in the year. So um, I finally, there was an alteration to that relationship <laughs> with my employers. And uh, I realized I had made, an, um, over the years, an immense amount of stuff. And a great deal of it was lost. Would never be performed again. And there's certain sections I really liked and certain things, dancerly things, that I thought were really good, especially for this particular generation of dancers that I thought they could perform extremely well. So um, 
it sort of made sense to find a context for this work, and I said it wasn't bound to its original composition, like our minor seventh there, you know, diminished seventh, I said, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we found ways to completely recontextualize these things. How, yeah. how, did, um, how did you have the dancers work with the material? Did they watch, because many of them, well, not many, but some of them would not ever have seen uh, the pieces that you were working with. Yes, Did but they watch video? No, but Did I kept re-reviving methodologies so they'd have experience with those methodologies. And... Um, yes, for example, things like... Uh, Scott. Yes. How the, f the phrase tuna or the idea of disfocus. What about the newer dancers who had never... Okay, so, so um, uh, the newer dancers, I, I made an entire piece only using methodologies for them so that they could become acquainted. It was called Hole in the Head, W-H-O-L-E. And um, that piece basically taught, caught them up 20 years. So they had, to, they had to make the piece out of all these other methodologies. And um, that caught them up pretty fast. Um, I said to the company the other day, it took us, um, I put the piece together in about two and a half hours, and originally in Brescia. And Which said, piece? Hole in the head? Oh, no, this, no, 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 this, this piece. piece, this piece. Yeah. And I said it took two hours and ten years. Mm. You know, and actually, and Dana piped up 30 years. <laughs> and actually, it's, you know, so it took 30 years to make the piece. But for the, this current generation, there are people who have been there 28 years, uh, uh, 25 years, 15 years, 17 years. One year. One year, yeah. So, um, or no, three weeks even, yeah. But um, you see, in general, the, that people are used to working that way. The way they exchange ideas, the way they pay attention, is just the way we work. You know, it's, it has a lot to do with just paying attention. But the, the actual movement phrases come from pieces. And so yeah. how did you, I mean, that's an unimaginable amount of movement material if you take 30 years worth of Dances. Right. So how, the op uh, so the opening dance, for example, is a variation is a variation on from Hole in the Head, which is a variation on Robert Scott, which is tuna, right? And then it goes. Maybe maybe you should explain what tuna is. Oh, tuna is a phrase. <laughs> it's a phrase. It's a based. Movement, it's a movement a, a sequence. Phrase. It's based on rotations. Yeah. And then Surreal and David go into theatrical arsenal immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And theatrical arsenal, uh, that particular event was related to an installation that got canceled at the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid, and uh, in which the dancer tries to create a non-transactionable movement, movement that would be hard to find a context for, right? Which is a self-defeating exercise, right? Because it's, Once they're already, it, they're already, no, they're already a in a context that yeah. actually valorizes their efforts to some degree. And David is um, uh, uh, a critic, so to speak, or, or the person that wrote that book we were talking about before with those rules in it that I can't find on Amazon, that one. And David, uh, David is that which is something that is very unpredictable. Yeah, David, try, he, David is a very good musician and so tries not to make music or at least music that it would be useful anywhere, you know, except in that context. So everything gets recuperated by theater. Yeah? Everything gets recuperated. Yeah? As soon as you put it on stage, it's recuperated. Mm. Yeah? No one cares if you're trying to fail. And we did that piece last year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. So, um, so that goes in that, then it goes into a, a, a part of heterotopia. Oh, what Dana was talking about beforehand in the work heterotopia, there's two rooms. The first room is a play that is all done in fictive languages, right? That is piped into a back room. It turns out that that play is the score, or the orchestra, so to speak, for the room in the back, and it's piped in live, and they have to interpret this um, work, this composition that's being done in the front room, but it's being done as a play in the front room. So um, you think it's one thing, but it's actually another thing, or it has another purpose. Yeah, and one is very abstract and, and neutral, and the other is quite theatrical. Yeah. So um, uh, we're working with prosody and and the 
lilt and rhythm of, of languages and this constant uh, what do you call it? lift mm. that is in language um, is what the, yeah is what the dancers are listening to then comes suspicion the scenes um, with the dancers are only um, only listening and trying to figure out if they can move off the text of Yasu which is another text that had been in the front room as part of the play um, then comes Yonin Surreal with uh, something also from Heterotopia, with Dana doing uh, a, a voice from Heterotopia, which is um, synthetic um, uh, Sc Scandinavian. She speaks Norwegian, but it's synthetic. So it sounds like Scandinavian, but it's not. Um, and then uh, the pan, I can't remember the panting comes from. And then Riley and Brigel come in with duo with the material, but they're allowed to reconfigure the material, but they have to keep arriving at certain points of sort of um, accords, so yes. to speak. Bah, bah, bah. So that's, that's a kind of pure um, emergent counterpoint. So is the suspicion thing. Yeah. So there's certain tempi. You have, you have with the legs, or you have these ta ta ka 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 ka. And after a while, if you look at it like that, you begin to see um, a kind of, how do you say? Kind of pointillistic uh, uh, counterpoint emerge visually. Yeah. Uh, how did you? And on and on and on. <laughs> I mean, I know it's it's sort of an impossible question, but you know, how were the choices made? Because you you had all this this material. Was it a matter of trying people out in different things, seeing what juxtapositions worked? It went pretty fast. Did it? Yeah, because yeah. I know who I had and I knew what they knew. Uh, and if they knew something, uh, they go, oh, I also know that. And I was like, oh, right, I forgot, yeah. So, um, but I basically scanned and thought, oh, I know what it was. You know, there's a ballet choreographer named uh, Alex Rotmansky. You know Alex Rotmansky? He's a really nice guy. And he was coming to Brescia in Italy where we had a tour. And um, I knew that. And so what I did, uh, uh, I wanted to fuck him up. Yeah, <laughs> so, because, uh, yeah. And so I did 4N first on purpose because 4N is very structured, right? And you're thinking, oh, okay, all very on purpose. But in the second part, if you think it's all structured in the same way, you're going to go, how the fuck did they do that? Like that, and like that. Because it's much more rule based, yeah, than it is um, uh, based on a, on a, on a, a straight through structure. You know, yeah, and, and uh, uh, Ramazzi was like, ha, 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 like that. So, and I was like, I'm fu just fucking with you. <laughs> you know, which is fun, why not? You know, you make a piece for your friends, you know? <laughs> and that's how this happened. So I made it just, so, so we end up having a conversation about, about composition, actually. Yeah, that's it. And how uh, we could not, uh, or how we could not depend on music, or what is musicality, finally? Dancers are inherently musical. So, um, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, actually, what about the use of music in this piece? Because you also use parts of scores from all these pieces, but not necessarily or even ever, perhaps, with the actual original material. Right. Most uh, cases. No, no, not in all cases. But yeah. yeah. Okay, the, now, Tom Willems, the composer who I've worked with for 30 years or more, uh, is right next to me, and we're having arguments during the show. And um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and <laughs> no, no, he's turning. turning he's it like, up. I'm turning it. Down. I'm like, hey. um, and um, he is watching, and he is according to certain densities. He's playing. He's composing. It's usually fairly, you know, it's very consistent, but he's composing um, as he watches it and according to what's ha actually happening. So he's basically reading the stage as a score. I did not know that. Yes. That's how it works with us. Yeah. So he has his composition. He knows what he wants to use for the scene, but he only plays according to what he sees. He's never I never ever see him looking at the keyboard ever. Hmm. He's always like this. And that's a lot actually and you think about what Tom Willems is doing he goes through about, I would say, 10 different settings for the keyboard, right? These are 10 different settings of samples. And so each, there's two keyboards, each with a different group of samples, and each of those changes maybe 10 times. 
and every time he knows exactly where the sample is. So he's transposed the note value to the pure sound value of the things. It's really, I, I think it's quite a tour de force. You, know, you don't, he doesn't get credit because you go like, oh, so, you know, st sound. stuff. Mm -hmm. And you assume it's, 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 mm -hmm. it's all pre-recorded or something, you know, it's not. So we're can I throw you at the end scene when Josh goes in the air and does a salto, and we're going, okay, I give Josh a signal, and I go, da, 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 warning on the thing, da, da, and ready, we gotta get, and da, ba, go, ba, da, and that's why it happens. So it gives you the illusion of intention, and that's what you want as a viewer. You want the illusion that there is some sort of structure behind it. You're, willi you're usually willing to accept, I mean, all of us as spectators, one is willing to accept degrees of, let's say, less decipherable structure if there are moments, points, at which it appears to have the qualities of intention. Mm -hmm. yeah? So um, um, some of the structures are simply like acting like there's a, um, a, one of the structures is everyone's instructed to act like there's instructions. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, what would that be, right? So that again, that's the behavior. So behavioral, be in other words, you then know the category of beha of of performers' behavior under those conditions, and so you act like a performer under those conditions. But I think that one of the things that gives your work um, uh, a, a satisfying. Um, feeling of, I don't know if structure is exactly the word, but you feel that there is, certainly last night I felt that there's an arc, there's, there's somehow, there's an emotional and there's a dynamic arc to the piece. So you have, you know, I think Bill is really brilliant at timing, that things, things work up to a sort of pitch of activity, they go away, they come back. But yeah, I made changes that wasn't satisfied last night. Last night I felt a bit, I, I felt draggy. And in a way, you know, you know, it didn't feel. Do any people play play instruments here? Do anyone play <laughs> I was, instruments? Uh, you know, and I was just about to say it's a bit like being a conductor. Like, yeah, it seems to no, me like no, it's not a bit like being. It is. It's like being a conductor. Yeah, so that you you you're just shaping it all the time, and I think that quality of live shaping it's, it's, is. It's very funny because my grandfather, um, the concert violinist, he, he tried to teach me violin, and he was he was Austrian. And he said, "You will not be a violinist. You will be a conductor." <laughs> and he I taught, remember you saying yeah, you wanted he you to be a he conductor. taught me really early to ah. conduct. Yeah, it's yeah. very funny. I yeah. think that instinct is it, there. There definitely have plans for me. But yeah. I think uh -huh. also there's something in the work that is not so much spoken about uh, in your work, which is that there is a real emotional content, and that doesn't come because people are acting or because they're in some sort of situation. It's just it's generated by um, an accumulation uh, of associations and ideas and experiences that you have while well, those experiences are particular to you as a as a um, audience member but they are also in some way more general and that I think you understand I don't know if you understand consciously but you understand at some level what you are doing I'm very so it's an emotional I'm, I'm, I'm no, not even a little bit uncalculating yeah, I'm very, very calculating so, so it's an emotional experience that you do I think you Feel I listen piece. to you all. I yeah. listen to you all. I listen to your reactions. I watch. You know the guys doing the board, the board, the board guy. You know, the the board audience member. Um, that's actually from standing in back for so long and realizing <laughs> if something isn't working, the heads start doing like this. All the little black silhouetted heads, all start doing this. Yeah. So um, I actually am listening very, very carefully to the audience. I cut several things last night short because I realized, okay. Mm -mm, it ain't happening, ta da da ciao, next scene, like that. And of course that can wreak havoc because some things should play out longer, and then sometimes you're waiting for the before you think, come on, come on, it's gonna happen, and then it doesn't happen, right? So you've let the scene go on too long, so then you have to ooh, compress, because you need, there's, um, okay, this is, this is how I operate. You, ha you have, Irregularity. Okay, the, you're watching. Yeah, let me do this for you. Okay, I'm, I'm doing this, and it's choreographed. This is an, this is a sequence, right? You don't give a shit. Your brain doesn't care. You know why? The brain says, "Oh, complicated hand movement." The brain is, yeah, right. It's saving energy. Freya, is this right? Brain's gone like, oh, well, don't need to spend energy on that because we can hire. You can. Um, 
hierarchically collapse it, right? You don't look at a tree and go branch, stem, leaf, 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 <laughs> unless you're, you know, something, you have some condition. And uh, so you, you're, you tree, tree, are, and the same thing goes for forest, right? So the same, same thing goes for, for motion, like that. So what you do is you set up irregularities, and then, you know, and then all of a sudden it goes like that. You go, oh, is that a trend? Will it continue? Yeah, uh, and then da, 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 go on like that. Oh, okay, it's a pattern. Yeah, but will it, you know, and what f form will it take? And that for me is the, really the the gerust. What is gerust? The the framework of narrative. It's just like music narrates the same way. It's tensions. Yeah, and you're looking for pattern emergence, and your brain is trying to be predictive. And your brain's going, what's going to happen next? And basically, what you have to do is you, you do this, and you're irregular, and then you're not irregular. Just because everyone thinks, oh, it's going to be irregular, otherwise your brain goes, oh, it's all going to be chaos. No, oh, it's not chaos. Oh, wait a minute, like that. So basically, the challenge as the conductor in the timings is to sustain your interest through a dialogue with your predictive uh, capacities. Is, it, is that right? Does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So, and that you can only do live because you have to sense how the audience is, is going. For example, the first night where there was a lot of, of young students or something in there, and they were having a laugh-a-thon. Yeah, they really were. And so you could let certain things sustain because they were pulling the audience with them. Yeah. Last night it was a different uh, mood there, so you had to go, oh, okay, that ain't flying, so boom, da -da, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, so, yeah, it's it really, it's it's live theater, you know? It's a living thing. Um, it's, it's not something you push the button and, and go. It's not like a film in that sense, yeah? But um, the process is like film, it's like live film editing, you know? I'm going to ask one more question that I'm going to make myself stop because we could go on <laughs> doing this all day. Is it lunchtime? Or probably, almost, I'm sure we've almost, run over yeah. time. Yeah. And I also think maybe someone wants to ask, while Bill's still here, Bill another question, or me if you like. Or, but, you know, saying this does make me think, or make me want to ask you, what about, you know, what about the, the ballets that you made a mm, while ago mm, that mm, are performed mm. by other companies that don't have those... Structures, um, those, those structures loose structures, yeah. And those poten that potential for... Conducting for for transforming the moment. So, how do you, how do you want how do you make that work? How do you see that working? Well, the uh, again, if, the, if if the Paris Opera is doing yeah, the biggest issue is 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 um, communicating musicality and, and your relationship to the music, which is fixed. And so, in that case, you have to be very very specific, and you're dealing with issues of retention, people retaining the information, and. Um, battling with their idea of, of what they think or who they think they should be in this balletic context, like I mentioned before. So they think they should present a certain um, a kind of character. <laughs> and um, I'm saying, well, I'm working on a, on a different thing and um, getting them to accept the fact that they have to be here at this angle and perform this at that speed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and saying it's possible, you know, you can, it's, it can be done. But the biggest challenge, I think, is, is ex um, having it make sense to them. And I find that that is the really interesting part, is, is having, the language, finding the language. Finding the language to, to, to make them understand why this is necessary, you know. So when you work with ballet dancers now, what do you... What do you tell them? You're an expert. And the reason you're in the room is because you're an expert. And you would not get in this room and stand here with me unless you were an expert. So you can, let's just start from there. Let's just work as experts, you know, because they're all professionals. So if, you, if you're in the room, you're an expert. They don't let experts, non-experts in the room, like, duh. Show, <laughs> you know. show me what you know. Yeah, yeah. No, let's work, no, show me everything you know about art. Yeah, and I also say don't practice, practice performance. Mm -hmm. Don't practice practicing, yeah, which is also valuable too, but practice performance. 
what, what you're, we're here to practice what you're going to perform, not just, um, you know, it's not just work in that sense. It's not drudge. 